Here are the sample problems for class 116 of math 117. Uh, we'll start out with one that looks rather theoretical and then move on to some that are highly numerical using the same concepts. Conditional expectation is defined whenever we have a countable partition, g sub n. And what I mean by the expectation of x conditioned on the sigma field g is we regard this sigma field as simply being made up of unions of sets in the partition g sub n. And for any omega, we figure out which set g sub n omega lies in and then treat that as if it were the whole sample space. That is, we do the expectation calculation integrating just over g sub n, and then we divide by the probability of g sub n to make the probability function that we've used integrate up to 1. And the challenge is to prove that this resulting random variable is integrable. Now, to make things easier, I'm going to dodge the issue of possible positive and negative values for x by using the fact that x is integrable if and only if the absolute value of x is integrable. So although I'm given that x itself is integrable, I'm going to assume that the absolute value of x is integrable. And then I'm going to calculate the expectation of the absolute value of the conditional expectation. So that means I have to integrate over my entire sample space the absolute value of the expectation of x conditioned on g. And what does this mean? It means that for each of the sets in the partition, from n equals 1, possibly to infinity, possibly just up to some finite upper limit, I have to choose a representative omega sub n in the partition, evaluate this conditional expectation, for that omega sub n, and then multiply by the probability of g sub n. There's less to this than meets the eye. This conditional expectation random variable can assume only a countable number of different values. And to calculate its expectation, we just take each of those values and multiply by the probability of that value and add it up. So we've got the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of the conditional expectation using the definition in the statement of the problem. I have to take the absolute value of the integral over gn of x dp. And then I have to multiply that by the probability of g sub n. And of course, that probability cancels right out. Now, here I am first calculating the expectation and then taking the absolute value. So it's possible, for example, that x might assume the value 2 some places in g sub n, and negative 1 other places. And when we average it all out, the average comes out to plus 1, and the absolute value makes no difference. If, on the other hand, I take the absolute value first, I would convert those minus 1s into plus 1s. So this is less than or equal to the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of what I get if I first take the absolute value and then 
do the LeBay integral. Of course, g sub n's form a partition, so that means I'm now integrating over the entire sample space, or if you prefer the other notation, I've calculated the expectation of the absolute value of x, and that proves the result. Okay, the next one's going to be a scratch ticket problem. Ed Purcell is one of the greatest teachers in the history of the Harvard Physics Department. He taught me introductory quantum mechanics when I was an undergraduate here, and he and I several times taught the introductory classical mechanics course together and taught the introductory electromagnetic theory course together. He's the author of a famous introductory book on electromagnetic theory. Okay, you've seen this scratch ticket done previously in the uh, lecture notes. I'm going to make one small change. I'm going to drop the strike price down to 14, and somehow that disappeared off the right edge of the screen. But I'll put it over here. Strike price. Is 14. That means that even if on day two the option has gone to node E in the diagram and this share is worth $20, since the strike price is 14, the option still in the money has a value of 6. Okay, we'll start by working out the um, probabilities. And when you don't have to take interest into account, this really becomes quite easy. You can argue that from node A, Either the price will go up by 10 or it will go down by 5, and therefore the probability that it goes down has to be twice as great as the probability that it goes up. Similarly from B, it could go up 5 to 35, or it could go down 10 to 20. So again, we have a higher probability associated with the smaller price change, two-thirds for going up, one-third to going down, and the probability of ending up at 35 must be two-ninths, while the probability of ending up at 20 is the sum of the probability via the top root and via the bottom root. For the bottom root, you can say it can either go up by 5 or down by 5. Therefore, both those probabilities have to be equal. And we have a probability of 1 ninth for the upper root. We have a probability of 2 thirds times 1 half, or um, what's that? 1 third, 3 ninths for the lower root. Some of those is 4 ninths. And finally, we have a probability of two-thirds times one-half, or one-third, or three-ninths of ending up there. Okay, now let's look at the option values on day two. That's easy. The value on day two, if we're at node D, is just the value of the share minus the strike price, or 21. At node E, it's 20 minus 14, or 6. And at F, 
the option has become worthless. Now, let's work backwards and figure out the values on day one. On day one, if the share price has gone up to 30, we have two-thirds probability that on day two, it will have gone to node D and have a value of 21. And we have a probability of one-third that the price will have dropped to 20, will be at node E, where the option value is 6. You've done this sort of calculation before. The only thing new today is we're doing it in two steps. That's 14 plus 2, or 16. If on day 1, the share price is 15, the only way the option can have any value is if the share price rises to 20, in which case the option is worth 6, and the probability that that will happen is 1 half. So we have a value on day 1 of 16 here and 3 here. And now we can work back to day zero. On day zero, we have a probability of one third that the share price is going to advance to 30, in which case we just figured out the value of the option is 16. We have a probability of two-thirds that the share price will drop to 15, in which case we just figured out the option value is 3. And 16 thirds plus 6 thirds is 22 thirds. Next time, we're going to recover this number by a uh, calculation that involves designing the perfect hedge and that never mentions these probabilities. Okay, now we're going to complicate the situation by introducing a non-zero interest rate. And I wanted to exploit the, va the fact that e to the 0 0.7 is very nearly 2, and that factor of 2 is pretty much 4 thirds over the first three years and three halves over the second four years. So I was trying to think of something that involved uh, seven years, and I turned to the Bible. So this story was made famous by Andrew Lloyd Webber in his Broadway musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And with that in mind, I've invented a mythical corporation called Sons of Jacob Grain Storage. And here's the biblical reference from Genesis. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one, or the one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. 
And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt, so the country may not be ruined by famine. So here's the deal. After three years, the shares in this new company may change in price. If the Nile floods are starting to look less good and this prediction of famine is looking as though it's about to come true, then the share price will rise to 50. If the Nile is behaving normally, well, maybe it's silly to put all this grain aside and the share prices will stay fixed at 30. And by the way, with an Egypt, Egyptian, with an Egyptian interest rate of 10% continuously compounding, 30 gold pieces in the bank would rise to $40 over this period of time. Finally, after seven years, maybe the famine has started, in which case the price of these uh, grain storage shares has gone up to 150 or it may be questionable and they're 50 or it may be that the Nile floods are continuing just fine and you wish you'd put your gold pieces in the bank. So what we now have to do is to work out the probabilities for this scenario and find the value of the option that you've been given. Now, how did you get the option? Well, it turns out you're a private detective. And uh, we've got a little instance of a possibly cheating wife, the notorious Mrs. Potiphar. Here's what the Bible has to say about it. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her, or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Well, this definitely calls for the services of a private investigator. You're that private investigator, and you have got a call option for one share of Sons of Jacob grain storage with a strike price of 36 gold pieces. Okay. Now let's do the hard work of working out the various probabilities. I think the easiest way to do this is to figure out what happens if you put your money in the bank. So here's no D at 150. Here's no E at 50. Here's node F at 30. Here's node B at 50. And between year 3 and year 7, money put in the bank increases by a factor of e to the 0 0.4, which I'm approximating as 3 halves. So you can now see in year seven dollars, the increase in price 
is 75, three times as great as the decrease in price, and therefore the possibility of that increase is one-fourth. The possibility of the decrease is three-fourths. Similarly, 30 gold pieces in the bank will go up by a factor of three halves to 45. That means the rise expressed in year seven dollars is only five. The drop is 15, and that means we have a three-fourths probability of going up and a one-fourth probability of staying the same. Okay, now let's start working out some option values. In year seven, it's very easy. This time the strike price did stray out on the screen. It's 38 gold pieces. And Deneen's notation for this function is it's x, the share price, minus 38 plus. Plus means you use this value only if it's positive, otherwise you replace it by zero. So the option, if we get to note D, is worth 150 minus 38, or 112. If we get to node E, the option is worth 50 minus 38, or 12. And if we get to node F, the option is worthless. Now let's work out the year three values. If we're at node B, we have a probability of one-fourth that the option will be worth 112. We have a probability of three-fourths that it will be worth 12, but that's in year $7. To go from year $7 to year $3, we have to divide by three halves. In other words, we have to multiply by two-thirds. That gives us 28 plus 9 times two-thirds, or 74 thirds. In the next class, I'm going to derive this number by quite a different procedure involving designing a perfect hedge. OK, let's try now with node C. This is even simpler. There's a probability of 3 fourths that the price will rise to 50. But that's year $7. Again, we have to multiply by 2 thirds in order to convert to year $3. So the value of the option at node C is 6. And now, in a fairly obvious way, we can work back to year 0. I can write v0 of a, but in fact, there's just one value for this. And what is it? Well, we notice that if for three years we put our gold pieces in the bank at the interest rates in Egypt, the balance in our account will increase by a factor of 4 thirds to 40. And therefore, in year $3, we have either a rise of 10 or a drop of 10. That gives us a probability of one half for going up and one half for staying the same. So we've got an option with a probability of one half of three years from now being worth 74 thirds gold pieces, a probability of one half of being worth six gold pieces. But those are year $3. We have to multiply by 3 fourths to discount those to year zero prices. I bet you were wondering at the start of the course 
why this was the topic with which we started out. It's because from now on, we're going to be using this discounting all over the place. So this is 74 over 8. The 3's cancel. Plus 18 over 8, which is 23 halves. I did my best to try to make all these values be integers, but the best I could do was little denominators like 2 and 3. I'll conclude with an example where using conditional expectation is just such an obvious way of solving a problem that you probably wouldn't even realize you were doing it. So here's the situation. We're imagining a student somewhere in China, say in Hunan, who decides he wants to go to an American university. He doesn't know much about American universities. Any American university will do for this guy. And there's a placement service in his town whose business is to file applications with American universities. He tells them, oh, file 18 or so applications. And what these people do is they go through Barron's directory of colleges, for each college they come to with a very small probability, they file an application to that college. And the effect is that he files a Poisson distribution of applications. The American universities can't make heads or tail of his credentials. So what they do is, in each case, they roll a die and admit the guy if the die roll comes up six. Otherwise, they reject him. The obvious random variable here is the number of acceptance letters that the student receives, and we want to calculate the expectation of that random variable. Now, if we use the definition of expectation, this would be a really messy calculation. Suppose, for example, we wanted to take into account getting admitted to three universities we'd have to calculate the probability that he filed three applications and all three were successful. And then we'd have to add on the probability that he filed four applications of which three were successful, five of which three were successful, and so on. So what we're doing instead is saying we're going to simplify our sample space. Let's think about a representative omega in the sample space is an integer n, the number of applications filed, combined with a sequence of n independent die rolls. Right? That's a possible outcome of this experiment. He files 10 applications, and the die rolls that come up are 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 1, 2, 3, 6. What I'm going to do is condition on the number of applications filed. Why am I going to do that? Because I know that if I roll a die n times, the expected number of sixes is just one-sixth of n. And therefore, the expectation of this random variable x is the sum over the partition g sub n, that's just the number of applications filed, from 0 to infinity. We take the expected number of acceptances if n applications are filed and multiply by the probability of filing n applications. That's given by a Poisson distribution. So we have a constant factor of 6 times the sum 
from 0 to infinity of n times e to the minus n times 18 to the n over n factorial. But this is just the expectation of a Poisson distribution with parameter 18. So this works out to 1 6 times 18 or 3. Now let me change the model a little bit. I'm going to partition the sample space as follows. There are three sets in the partition. G1 is 0 to 12 applications filed. G2 is 13 to 20 applications filed. And G3 is more than 20. In each of these cases, we know the probability of an acceptance. My model is that with fewer than 12, yeah, I guess I really should have said less than or equal to 12. OK, 0 to 12, we've got a probability of Three six or one half for thirteen to twenty applications, the probability of success for any one of them is one third, and for more than twenty, it's one sixth. So now, at least in principle, I can work out the expectation of x. It's one half times the probability of filing 0 to 12 applications times n. So that's n times e to the minus 18 times 18 to the n over n factorial. Then we continue with our sum over the Poisson distribution, this time summing from 13 to 20, n times e to the minus 18 times 18 to the n over n factorial, and multiplying that by 1 third. And finally, we take 1 sixth times the part of the sum where we're summing over values 21 and greater. Well, that would be messy with a calculator, but it turns out that statistical software like R has built-in functions that help you do precisely this sort of thing. There's a built-in function that will tell you the probability that a given Poisson distribution with a certain parameter has a value that is less than or equal to n. So you could work this out numerically if you wanted to. I don't, and we're done.